I, I think um, in view of the fact you've also been looking at um, the history of climate, and one of the things that uh, people who say that we're exaggerating often observe, uh, almost the first thing in the UK people say is, oh, well, you know, there have been ups and downs in climate. There was the medieval warm period. This is not uh, so much out of the way. And with Gavin Schmidt, we actually have somebody who is a climate scientist at uh, the NASA Institute for Space Studies, but he is a student of the causes of climate change in the past, in the present, and in the future and uh, therefore is well qualified to deal with uh, what is often um, advanced as a reason for not being so alarmed and sober. Dr. Schmidt. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I'll, I'll, I'll start with a very personal note. My, uh, my grandfather was Greek and was born in Athens um, and was a member of the Greek Orthodox Church. And, uh, and his great-grandfather uh, was the uh, designer of what were the royal gardens in Athens. And there's a little plaque uh, that says uh, uh, to, um, you know, in, in support of uh, Frederick Schmidt, who was my ancestor who designed those gardens. Um, so this is actually quite interesting uh, to be here today. I'm going to talk about um, climate models, I'm going to talk about climate policy, and I'm going to, uh, there's a little bit of overlap with, uh, with Robert's uh, talk, so I'll skip those things, so I'll talk more about the things that, um, are, uh, that are unique to, uh, to me. Uh, we've talked about uh, how climate does change. We've seen these graphs before. One of the things that people often worry about is, you know, these, these very small, can you, we can't see that really. These very small um, ups and downs that you get in the global mean, the noise in the system. Um, if you look at any one location, if we look at New York City, which is the, the ups and downs in the red lines up in here, you know, in any one location, the ups and downs are much larger than they are in the global mean. We get, we get a signal out of the climate system by averaging lots of information together. And you have to do that, otherwise you just see static. And it's only when we put everything together that we get a good picture of what's going on in the system. And and that works, you know, both at the monthly level, the annual level, uh, and uh, and at the global level. Um, Robert mentioned, you know, well, you know, how much does does a couple of uh, tenths of a degree matter? Does the planet even notice? Well, the planet does notice. These are old photographs of glaciers. Uh, one in the Alps, uh, one in, uh, in the Rockies in Canada, and you can go to any of the glacier uh, air, glaciated areas around the world. You can go to the Himalayas, the Andes, um, Africa, uh, anywhere you like, and you see very similar things. This is from about a hundred years ago, and this is the situation today. From exactly the same spot, you go back and you look, and things are very different. The planet notices small changes, and uh, that's, uh, that's, that's the key issue that we have to face. Um, changes that we can see are already affecting uh, communities. This is, uh, the, the first one is a, is a house in, uh, in Shishmaref, which has now uh, collapsed. These are uh, people that unfortunately built their houses on sand. It was frozen sand when they built it, and they were in the middle of, of an ice field. Now they're no longer in the middle of the ice field. The, the ground has, has unfrozen, and the, the sea has just washed the sand away. And so that entire village uh, had to be moved. Um, the, uh, the, the, the last picture at the bottom there is actually quite interesting. That's uh, a picture of the, um, the, the reservoir behind the uh, Glen Canyon Dam. So that's Lake Powell. Um, the, the white line that you can see is where the reservoir was when it was full back in the early 90s. It hasn't been full for a long time. Uh, there are two reasons for that. One is that it hasn't been raining as much, and so part of the American Southwest has been in a drought condition for, for a couple of decades now. Um, but we're also drawing more water out. The use of that water uh, has accelerated dramatically because of the population, because of the increase in agriculture uh, downstream in the Colorado. And so this illustrates the, the two things. Uh, climate change isn't good or bad. You know, it's, it's not something uh, that's intrinsically uh, has some value. But uh, our society relies on the climate. And it's the intersection between climate change and our needs for climate services that causes uh, the particular problem that we had. So, you know, if climate change uh, does change because of natural processes, well, that's fine. But when, when we have built our entire society based on assumptions about climate not changing, uh, then that has a serious consequence. 
So what is it that we try to do? So I'm a climate modeler. I work for the NASA uh, on one of the big climate models. There's, there's about three groups like this in the US. There's about 20 groups like this in the, uh, in the, uh, in the world. Um, and what we're trying to do is actually very ambitious. What we're trying to do is explain everything that's going on in the planet. Um, the, the, you know, the movements of the rain bands, the wet and dry seasons in the tropics, the storm systems in the, uh, in the, um, the mid-latitudes, the coming and going of the sea ice in, in the Arctic. And we're trying to model that just based on our knowledge of the very, very small scale things that are going on. The amount of water that's evaporated from the ocean when the wind blows. The amount of rain that comes from a certain kind of cloud. The amount of uh, ocean current and how fast that goes when the wind blows the way it does. And so just based Based on those very, very small scale physical processes that we can go out and measure, we put all of these things together and what we're trying to do is predict the emergent properties of the climatology, the emergent properties of what is going on in the climate, all the big scale features that, that you can see. So that's, that's the climatology. And, and we're also trying to predict how variable it is. You know, why is one winter cooler than another winter? Why, is, why does the El Nino effect in the, in the Pacific happen the way it does? So we're also trying to work out why it's changing and why it's unstable. Now, that in and of itself would be a great intellectual task, and it would be something uh, worthy of, uh, of, of humanity's uh, intellectual endeavor, uh, purely in and of itself. Uh, but the real reason why uh, we care about this is, that, is because we're kicking this system extremely hard. Now, for, the, for those of you who are American in the audience, let me, let me stress that the donkey there is not, uh, is not implying not that it's only the Democrats who are causing this. Um, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty ecumenically shared across different political parties. Um, and we're kicking this system when we don't know what's going to happen. Right? We don't know what's in that box. We don't know how the system is going to respond because we have no analogues for what it is that has happened to the planet. Um, there are lots of different things that cause the planet to change, uh, to change its climate, um, and, they, and they range from wobbles in the Earth's orbit to variations in the sun to the effects of big, large volcanoes to the effects of industrial activity to the effects of, of aerosols, small particles in smoke and in, um, in exhausts that, that, that create changes in how the sun's radiation penetrates the atmosphere. Changes to the ozone layer, that also affects climate. Changes to deforestation, that changes climate. Um, contrails change climate. There are lots and lots of different factors which are all kind of making, uh, uh, making the climate change. And so we have to put all these things together. The way we do it is we, it, we use a little bit of a trick um, called the radiative forcing. We try and compare, put all of these things on the same scale and see which ones are big, which ones are small, what kind of time scale they have. Uh, the, the green line that you can see going off into the, uh, the sunset there, that's the greenhouse gases, that's the carbon dioxide and the methane and the nitrous oxides and the CFCs. Uh, you can see the big spikes at the bottom pointing down. Those are cooling events associated with big volcanoes. So. Um, uh, Mount Pinatubo in 91, uh, Mount Agung in uh, 1963, and going all the way back to Krakatoa in 1883. So those have big uh, negative uh, cooling effects on the climate. You can see that there's a little bit of a line there that's going up and down with about an 11-year cycle. You probably can't see it because it's quite small. That's, that's the effect of the sun. That's, that's the solar cycles that you, that you often hear talking about. All of these things are very small compared to the change that's going on because of the greenhouse gases. When we put all those things together and we say, okay, well, all those things have happened over the 20th century, um, let's put them into our models and let's compare what we saw over the 20th century to what we actually measured over the 20th century. And then we get pictures like these. So the SAT stands for surface air temperature and the black line um, in, the, in this picture here, that's the actual data going up and you can see this is about the 1900 to 2000. Um, and the yellow background is what the models predict should have happened. And you'll see that there's a, there's a, there's a band around it. It's not a perfect match. Okay, well, the not perfect match is because of weather. It's because of the, just the general internal variability of the system, the chaotic nature of the weather that we can't predict, that we're not in a position to be able to say that's caused by, you know, carbon dioxide, that's caused by the sun, or that's caused by a volcano. It's just the stuff that just happens. Um, but the background, the trends, and the, uh, the large-scale patterns, those are predictable. And we know that 
our input has made a difference by comparing that graph to the one below it, where you see the blue uh, envelope, and that's what we predict would have happened in the absence of any human activity, right? And so you can see that the real world has diverged quite dramatically from what the natural uh, world would have done in the absence of our effects. Now, the problem is, and this is a really big problem for, for policymakers, is that all the things that we're doing to the climate, they're all linked, right? If we uh, chop down a forest and burn the wood and the, and, the, and the organic matter, we produce not only carbon dioxide, but carbon monoxide and methane and black carbon. If we uh, open a coal-fired power station, particularly in China, then not only do we have carbon dioxide, but we also have sulfate aerosols. We also have carbon monoxide. We also have black carbon. Um, and if you've been to... Uh, if you've been to China any time uh, recently, you will know that the extra things that are going on, the stuff that's being put into the atmosphere that causes the incredible haze uh, that, that blocks out the sun even at midday, uh, those are being caused by the same things that are causing climate change. And in fact, they're contributing to climate change. And so when people are coming up with policies to deal with these issues, you know, you've got all these trade-offs. And scientists, we haven't been very good at, at thinking about what those trade-offs mean for policymakers. We've said, okay, well, carbon dioxide does this, and aerosols do that, and methane does this. But we, we haven't been linking this to the actual process that's, that, that has been producing these different things. One way to look at this, and this is probably a little technical for this audience, but, but if, you look, if, you, if you bear with me, it, it, it might become a little bit clearer. Um, the, uh, you, can, you can measure what's actually in the atmosphere. You can say, okay, well, how much methane is in the atmosphere, how much sulfate is in the atmosphere. And you can say, well, you know, these are the th this is how much uh, it's changing the climate. And you can see this big, the big bar on the side, that's carbon dioxide. It's the main thing that's going on. Then you've got methane, which is a little bit smaller uh, on the side. But if you actually think about not what's in the atmosphere now, but what we're actually putting into the atmosphere. What is the impact of the methane that we're putting into the atmosphere? What is the impact of the carbon monoxide and the volatile organics, all of which cause ozone, and they change uh, um, the, the, the oxidation processes by which sulfates are formed and things like that. It turns out that methane is much, much more important because of all the things that are going on in the atmosphere, the atmospheric chemistry and all the links between the different processes. And so, the details of this don't matter so much, but the, the point is that the view that you look at, if you look at the scientist's view, just what's there and what that's causing, and then you look at you know, what we're doing, you know, the views change and the perspective changes. Um, the future projections, you know, these are business as usual type, uh, type of, uh, of projections, what's going to happen. Well, okay, we saw these graphs before. We think very robustly that the planet is going to warm. With some of the business as usual scenarios, the planet is going to warm quite significantly. Even with mitigation, and the with mitigation line here is actually much more aggressive than what people have agreed to do, um, we're still going to have global warming. We're still going to have a need for adaptation. We're still going to have sea level rise and temperature rise and changes in rainfall. But one of the key things that that people often don't realize is not everything that we talk about when we're talking about climate model results is robust. Um, some of the things that we talk about changes in, in rainfall, in particular in particular regions, some models say the Sahel it will get wetter. Some other models say the Sahel will get drier. Some models say that the monsoon will intensify in India, and some say that it will become less. Now, that is very disturbing because you know we're talking about a billion people who are going to be affected by these things and yet the modelers are saying well we don't know which way it's going to go we think that things are going to change very dramatically but you know there's a there's a balance here and it might change because of these things or it might change because of those things change is the constant but which direction it's going is very uncertain and that is very problematic for us um, especially, you know, I'm going to skip this because Robert mentioned how, uh, how uncertain uh, ice sheets were. Um, but people often, often ask me, you know, so what, what does that mean? What does it mean when somebody says that a model says X? Um, should I take that seriously? Why should I take, you know, what I say seriously or why, what anybody in the IPCC uh, says? You know, should you take that seriously? So there's a number of d d tests that you, can, that you can apply. So the first thing to ask is, you know, if a result is that something that comes up in lots of different models? 
right? So that's, that's the first thing. If it's just one model, it could just be some weird thing. It might be right, but it could just be some weird thing. You need to have backup evidence. Does the result make any theoretical sense? Okay, well, if it does make some sense, you know, it, it, that you know, the, the large-scale patterns are leading to this, then, okay, well, that's, that's some support. And have we seen something in the observations already? There's lots of things that people project where there's no evidence for that in the observations already, sometimes because the data isn't good enough, sometimes because the signal is small, but it does mean that you have to be a little bit more careful about uh, interpreting that. And then, thirdly, you know, do the predicted magnitudes of this change and the theoretical magnitudes of this change and the observed magnitudes, do these things all match up? And so if that's the case, then these things might be robust. So when it comes to temperature rises, all of those things fit. You know, we have a good idea, it makes physical sense, the theory is right, the model is right, and it's, and it's matched by the observations. When it comes to something like uh, the connection between hurricanes and global change, well, then it doesn't line up. You know, the magnitudes of what's predicted, the theory is very complicated, the observations are a little obscure, and so you're correct in thinking that that's a more uncertain part of the science. Coming back to what people can do, um, people can tackle real things. They can tackle um, emissions in China from their power stations. We can tackle emissions from, from cars and trucks in America. We can tackle um, pollutants uh, from power stations in Europe. All these things are kind of within the scope of the Americans and the Europeans and the Chinese to tackle. What we want to know is which of those things we should be tackling to get the, the biggest bang for the buck. Which ones give us win-win scenarios both for climate change and for air pollution and for stresses on ecosystems and for reducing deforestation? Can we find economic and environmental um, uh, tools that would that, that get everything uh, right, as opposed to all of us having to trade off, you know, do we want to improve air pollution at the cost of global warming? You know, what kind of, that, that's a terrible calculus for us, to be, for us to be thinking about. And it turns out that when you do all those kind of things based on, on the different sectors, there are two key elements uh, that we could be tackling that would provide win-win solutions for a whole range of different environmental problems. Uh, one of them is uh, the use of coal and biomass in Asia for domestic burning. This produces uh, black carbon, it produces air pollution, it produces methane, it produces carbon monoxide, it produces climate change. By tackling that, we can alleviate climate change problems, we can alleviate air pollution problems, we can alleviate public health problems and, uh, and deforestation problems all at once. So those are great targets for us to be focusing on. And modeling and understanding all of the different interactions of all those different elements are, uh, the, uh, are pretty much the key tool uh, to allow us to do that. Um, I'll just skip that. So let me quickly conclude. Um, We've been able to explain most of what's gone on in the climate over the last 150 years, and actually much further back, um, uh, using what, what the physics that we know, the physics of greenhouse gases, the physics of aerosols, the physics of ozone depletion, uh, and, and the like. We know that because the planet is still catching up with what we've already done, there will be warming to come, warming that's in the pipeline as the planet catches up with what's in the atmosphere now. But we're increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And so what's our, the minimum that we can get away with uh, is still going to be warmer still. So we're not going to be able to stop global warming in any of our lifetimes. All we need, all our choices are, are to make it more or less serious. Um, increases in carbon dioxide emissions are going to continue. Um, methane, black carbon, CFCs are being controlled and are more controllable and actually uh, give us very good uh, targets for buying us a little bit of time. We can reduce the amount of methane in the atmosphere, we can reduce the amount of black carbon, we can reduce the amount of CFCs. Um, in my opinion, uh, the forcing is probably not yet at a dangerous level. Uh, but that's very much my personal opinion, and if I was an Inuit living on the coast of Alaska, I'd probably have a very different opinion about that. One of the, the key things that people have to remember is that the key impacts, you know, where people live and the things that they depend on, rainfall uh, estimates in the American Southwest, rainfall estimates in, in uh, the Mediterranean, these are not as strongly constrained as the temperature rises. Um, and that's, that's very, uh, that's very troubling. Um, the one thing that is good 
uh, for my own, uh, for my own, uh, you know, personal uh, career uh, path, is that climate change is a long-term issue. It's not going to go away anytime soon, and I'm going to be, unfortunately, giving talks like this uh, for the next 30 years. <laughs> Um, and I'll just, I'll just quickly uh, finish off, and, and because these are, these are very true things. So one is from Niels Bohr, who said, uh, prediction is difficult, particularly of the future. And he was, he was very right. You know, we're not fortune tellers. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. And, and it's because we don't know exactly what's going to happen uh, that climate scientists are saying, you know what, maybe we better slow down a little here. Um, and there was, there was a terrible movie, which I'm sure none of you have seen uh, because you have much uh, more elevated tastes than that, called The Day After Tomorrow, which was a, a, a disaster, climate disaster movie. And there's, there's one point, a particularly stressful point, where somebody runs into the, the control room and, uh, and they've given up on the models. And he says, grid models can't save us now. And it's true, you know, the models are not going to save us. You know, it's our actions that make a difference. It's not what the models uh, tell us about. And um, just, uh, you know, if you want to learn more about climate change and you want to learn, you know, more about the background and how scientists are actually going about trying to find these things, I have a book uh, called Climate Change Picturing the Science, which is a collaboration with photographers, uh, people that work for National Geographic, Newsweek, Time, uh, and the like, to, to tell a more complicated story about climate change, to get away from the cliches of polar bears and, um, with, the, with all due respect uh, to, to the Arctic people, um, and, and extreme weather. And, uh, and I'll just leave it at that. Thank you very much. Well, if it weren't so serious, it would be intellectually absolutely fascinating. Uh, yes, <laughs> and, uh, that's exactly it. <laughs> but I think that your call that we should pass on to action uh, is uh, the perfect introduction to uh, our next speaker. We want to break for coffee at um, 11.20. And so we'll have five minutes for uh, just pointed um, questions, which uh, perhaps we could consider in the break. But uh, I'd like now, since you've uh, opened the door to action, to invite uh, Brigadier General Michael Walsh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. He tells me that, of course, he was the chief engineer supporting General Petraeus. But uh, he also hinted that his present role uh, with the Mississippi River Commission is likely to be even more testing. General Walsh. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. And uh, his most uh, all holiness, eminences, and uh, distinguished delegates and members of, uh, of my committee. Uh, I would like to uh, talk to you a little bit about the, uh, the Mississippi uh, River and restoring the balance. As we go through the discussion, I'll talk to you a little bit about the uh, Civil Works, uh, Corps of Engineers Civil Works program, not only for the Mississippi Valley, but also for our nation. An overview of the Mississippi Valley and a little bit of the history of the, uh, of the valley, and then talk to you perhaps of one of the futures of the uh, third largest watershed in the, uh, in the world, and then talk to you about uh, some collaboration efforts. If we can go to the, uh, the next slide. The uh, Corps of Engineers is really proud to have a responsibility in helping to care for our nation's water uh, resources. We're not the only federal agencies or, or, uh, or government that does that, but we uh, are very proud of the piece that we work on, on coastal protection, environmental protection and restoration, flood control, hydropower, navigation, navigable waters, uh, recreation, which is key and important to our people as well. One of the biggest challenges of the, uh, for the Corps of Engineers and many other federal and government agencies is trying to find that right balance between often conflicting concerns that our society is asking for its engineers and scientists uh, to do with our water resources. The Corps of Engineers seeks to achieve the best possible balance among these competing demands with an, ha, by having an integrated approach to, uh, to water resources management that focuses on not only the river that's outside uh, the particular city that we're in, but looking at it from a regional approach and how the impacts are going to uh, impact the entire, uh, and the entire watershed. In recent years, we have implemented this approach largely in concentrating on, on the watershed, and I'll talk a little bit about that in just a few moments. Now, as was mentioned, I am the uh, division commander for the Mississippi Valley Division, and I'm also the president-designee of the Mississippi uh, River Commission. 
I'm the uh, division commander of one of nine that the chief of engineers uh, has, and he'll be here to uh, address you uh, tomorrow. In that uh, division, in my division, we have uh, six subordinate uh, offices from uh, Canada on down to, uh, to the lowest uh, office that I have here is in, uh, in New Orleans, and about 5,000 uh, employees. You can see uh, me in uniform, and you may think that those 5,000 employees are, are Army, and I can tell you there's about, in, in the Corps of Engineers, there's about 600 military and about 34, 35,000 uh, civilians. Uh, so the Corps of Engineers is not just uh, is not just military, but because of a, a quirk in our in our history, uh, the uh, water resources of our portion of it is taken care of in our Department of Defense. And as I have uh, numerous conversations with my counterparts along. Uh, many different countries I've been in the world, they all often ask me, how did the U.S. Army get involved with, uh, with water resources? But that's another 20 minutes, which I won't, uh, I won't go into. Uh, next slide. From uh, the area that I particularly work in is Mississippi Valley Division. We look at uh, navigation as one of our key missions. I have uh, 59 locks, uh, locks and dams that we're working on, uh, 4,200 miles of commercial uh, waterways. 51 shallow, uh, shallow draft harbors and seven deep draft harbors. In the flood, uh, flood damage reduction, I have 36 reservoirs that we keep track of, 56 uh, pumping stations, over 8,000 miles of, uh, of levees. You can see in the environmental stewardship as well, over uh, 48,000 acres uh, for environmental uh, stewardship mitigation acres. We also have uh, four hydropower plants, and we do emergency management up and down the river, typically address uh, five to nine emergency uh, presidential emergency operations a year. Uh, last year, of course, we were down here working, uh, working Gustav and Ike. We worked the uh, floods up in uh, Cedar Rapids in, in Iowa uh, last, uh, last spring, and this past winter we also worked at uh, Fargo-Moorhead trying to work that city, as, uh, um, trying to save that city from the floods that were coming uh, in that direction as well. The, uh, next slide. In regards, to the, in regards to the history, the Corps of Engineers has been involved with the Mississippi Valley since 1824, first by working on a navigation part of, uh, of the center of our country, uh, by doing surveys and trying to pull snags out of the, uh, out of the river so that our river traffic, riverboat traffic, can move up and down the, uh, the Mississippi and open the center part of our country. Beginning in 1861, we started working what we call a levees-only approach to try and uh, limit the amount of dredging that we had to do into the river and also enhance uh, navigation during that time frame. In the 1920s, uh, hundreds and hundreds of miles of levees were built in the lower part of the, uh, of the Mississippi, not only for navigation but also for flood damage reduction. And then in the 1930s, uh, we started working on, in this country on our locks and dams from Lock and Dam 26 up to Lock and Dam 3 up in the northern part of our, uh, northern part of our country, again, for, uh, for navigation. 1979, uh, over 100 years ago, over 180 years ago, the uh, Congress had put together the Mississippi River Commission, of which I'm the president, uh, president now, trying to develop a comprehensive plan for uh, the Mississippi Valley for flood control, uh, flood damage reduction, and, uh, and navigation. And then, of course, we had the, uh, the great flood of 19, uh, 1927. I think there were some discussions uh, about that, which great portions of, uh, of the center part of the United States was, uh, was inundated, and many, many people were living on top of the levees and were killed during that time frame. Congress uh, put together the 1928 law, which put together a project called Mississippi River Tributaries Project, which asks us, the Corps of Engineers, to enhance our flood damage reduction systems so that there wouldn't be a uh, continued flood on the lower part of the, uh, of the Mississippi. Uh, during that act, the requirement from our Congress was to put together a comprehensive and unified systems of public works in the lower part of the Mississippi that provided protection for flood and also work on the navigation piece. Let me jump uh, real quickly to a, uh, to a different discussion. As was, as was mentioned, I was uh, General Petraeus's engineer in Iraq uh, for a year. That was in October of uh, 06 to, uh, to October of 07. And from that uh, job, my uh, next assignment, next slide, was to come to the, uh, to the Mississippi Valley Division. So what I typically would do is, is try and read the history 
uh, of the area that I'm particularly going to work with. And so I read these, uh, these books upon their shoulders, Designing the Bayous, uh, Lanterns on the Levees, uh, Rising Tide. I think uh, John Barry addressed you uh, yesterday, and I know he's out in, in the audience, so I won't, uh, won't talk much about his book, because uh, he'll, uh, he'll, he'll talk to me about it afterwards. Uh, and then, of course, um, the rivers we have, uh, we have wrought. As I read through the history of, of our river and, and about ready to take this job, I asked, what is the future? Where is that book that provides me what the future of the third largest watershed in the world? What's that supposed to look like? And, and staff went away for, for a little, little bit, and I called them back in a couple of weeks later, and, and I asked them, well, where is that book that defines the future of the third largest watershed in the world? And uh, regretfully, there is not a, uh, a book that defines what the uh, third largest watershed, the Mississippi uh, Valley uh, watershed, is supposed to look like 100 years from now. And so what we're looking at, next slide, what we're looking at is what is that governing body that covers down on the third largest watershed in the world. As you can see here, it covers down on three Corps of Engineer divisions. There's three other, there's two other engineer generals that also provide support in this particular area. This uh, Mississippi Valley division covers 1.25 million acres, uh, uh, square miles, pardon me, 1.25 million square miles. 41% of the United States puts water into, uh, into uh, the, uh, the Mississippi. So part of my job now is to try and develop what that future, what should be the working future of the third largest watershed uh, in the world, and what is that intergenerational commitment that we can do that will impact not only the valley, but also, as mentioned a few times, uh, the globe as well. And so at working with the Mississippi River Commission and 20 to 30 uh, public meetings in the past two years, we came together and put together this next slide that we're, we're, I'm calling is uh, America's watershed, perhaps a 200-year vision of what we should be looking at on, our, on the third largest watershed in the, uh, in the world. Uh, I'll, let you, uh, I'll let you read through that as a talk. Most of the intergenerational commitment, what we're looking for in this valley, has to do with uh, comprehensive flood damage reduction, uh, national security, environmental sustainability and recreation, Certainly infrastructure and energy, water supply, water quality, and the movements of goods in agriculture and manufacturing. And you can see what we're looking at from a working vision on what we should have on the third largest watershed in the world. Well, what I'm finding, of course, is the same thing that you would find is everybody's interested in a different aspect in the river's bounty, whether it's navigation or improve, improving uh, flood risk reduction, clean air, clean water, sustainable ecosystems. But everybody wants their particular piece outside their particular town. And so how do we put together a vision that will encompass the entire valley of the, uh, the Mississippi Valley? Our immediate goal is to look at the entire watershed from a planning perspective and make the best, most enduring use of our water resources, both economically and environmentally. <coughs> And so this is our, our first attempt at what we should be looking at from, uh, from the Mississippi River Commission. And we're working with many other agencies, uh, public and private, on trying to figure out what should we be looking at for the next, um, for the next 200 years. Uh, us Americans, uh, as we look at uh, 200 years, people's eyes roll over and we're really looking at what's happening uh, next week. So trying to make sure that people understand the long-term commitment that we need to put uh, not only on our globe but also on our, on our uh, valley is significant and we have a good, uh, a, a good start on that. You can't, uh, can't get a briefing from a military guy unless I give you a quick uh, mission statement, so let me put that up. Uh, the key item that, I, that I'd like you to draw your attention to is providing collaborative engineering solutions to all of those activities that you can see below that, uh, below that word. A lot of the work that the Corps of Engineers has done in the past was single mission focused uh, requirements, perhaps just navigation, perhaps just flood control, flood damage reduction, perhaps just ecosystem, just Hyd uh, um, hydropower. What we're looking for now is how to put together an engineering solution that uh, uh, involves multiple uh, criteria and uh, providing collaborative engineering solutions to, uh, to our nation. So what we've done in this past year, next slide, 
is you can't read this document, but this is a document that signed off by 15 federal agencies, uh, U.S. federal agencies, that says that we need to recognize the third largest watershed as a single, uh, single entity, that it demands our attention, our vigilance, and our dedicated uh, action. We agree with this, uh, with this document, which we sent to Washington, that a single agency approach is not effective, that we need to put a network of cross agencies uh, together that'll foster and provide incentives to government to work with non-governmental agencies, industry, and stakeholders to realize the goals that I had described previously. So what we're looking at is, is a lot of collaboration with, uh, with many different folks as we try to, uh, to drive this, uh, uh, this vision, uh, this intergenerational commitment, uh, for perhaps for, uh, for 200 years. And so we've been collaborating with a lot of different organizations. Next slide is we just had uh, our second annual uh, river uh, rainfall, rainfall forecasting summit with a number of scientific organizations as well as uh, non-governmental organizations to try and do a better job in forecasting uh, rainfall and river traffic. Next slide. We also uh, have worked with a number of non-governmental organizations and we've signed documents with, the, uh, with Ducks Unlimited. Next slide. Audubon Society and we also had here in, uh, in New Orleans in March of this year a diversion summit where we brought 45 uh, scientists together to brief a group of about uh, 250 people for, for two days on what uh, the impacts are of, uh, of climate change, sea level rise are going to have uh, on coastal, uh, coastal Louisiana. As I mentioned, over 270 folks were, uh, were in attendance to discuss the coastal restoration land building, and how do we proceed, uh, proceed from here. Uh, next slide is a, is a quick transition. Uh, talks a, about uh, not only the, my division, but also the uh, many folks that we have still in support of uh, operations in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Mo all of these people that you see on these slides are civilian members of the, uh, of the Corps of Engineers. We have 79 of them that are downrange uh, right now supporting uh, the people that need engineering support in Iraq and Afghanistan. And about 600, almost 700 of uh, these civilians have been downrange since we've been in uh, sustained uh, combat operations. Uh, next slide. I see I have just a, a few more moments, but in closing, I think I've shown you a number of examples where the Corps is putting together collaborative engineering teams, trying to take the science that we're hearing, develop that into, in, into engineering and provide support uh, to, our na to, to the peoples of our nation and the peoples of the world. I've talked to you about uh, America's river and, and America's heritage and collaborative engineering solutions and that we require a unified vision and an intergenerational commitment. Certainly one of the challenges that, uh, that we have in climate change is what's going to happen cer certainly in the, uh, in, the coastal in the coastal areas. We have had uh, many discussions on trying to, to work the policies and the engineering on how to, uh, how to affect the coast. We have set up a science and technology office between the Corps of Engineers, federal government, and the state of Louisiana to work the science and the technology on how to, uh, on how to protect the, uh, the coast. We have got a number of studies that are ongoing uh, that will look at coastal restoration as well as uh, coastal protection, and we've given uh, those reports to our Congress, and they're reviewing those, uh, reviewing those now. But one of, the, uh, one of the key things that I just wanted to bring up is that the Corps of Engineers has put together an engineer circular that talks about sea level rise. Now, we've been talking about putting together this engineer circular for, uh, for many, many years, but we finally got the engineers uh, to agree with the scientists on what uh, sea level rise is going to, uh, is going to affect our nation. And, and that engineer circular is, uh, is 1165-2-211. And I just throw that out there. It doesn't mean anything to you, but it means a lot to us engineers and part of the, uh, the Corps of Engineers, and be happy to, uh, to share that with you as needed, that addresses sea level rise from an engineering perspective on coastal, uh, coastal U.S. Sir, it's been a, uh, a privilege to be part of uh, be part of your channel and uh, panel, and I yield back uh, three minutes. Oh. Well, it's very good after the global scenarios, uh, after the science, 
Uh, we've had it translated into the complexity of the action, the collaboration needed in a particular area, a very vital area, the Mississippi Basin, and we're extremely grateful for the engineer's view of uh, the one picture of reality we've been shown. Uh, just before we break for a quarter of an hour uh, of coffee, um, are there uh, questions? The um, ambassador for the environment of uh, the Republic of France. Thank you, my lord. Uh, just uh, first to congratulate General Walsh because uh, he gave an answer to the question I asked yesterday mm -hmm. when he was not there. Of course, it's strange for a Frenchman to see a, a general in charge of uh, water policy, but I think that the, it's not our tradition, but uh, I think that military and civilian administration are working together with a sense of uh, service public. And in any case, it's a matter of urgency in our countries, and so it's good that the army is taking care of that issue. I was about to, to ask a question to uh, um, uh, Dr. Carroll. I don't know, he's behind the, behind the... Yeah, I'll stand the, up the screen. Screen. <laughs> I was not hiding, honest. No, it's just because some of the figures he gave uh, were um, very interesting for me. I just want to say that uh, we've had in the European Union, and I'm representing here, uh, the Minister for Ecology of France, we've had a strong commitment of action those past 10 years. So it's not only a question of um, what we have to do in the future, considering the fact uh, we all know, and I know that we're all convinced in that room, of course. It's how to put pressure uh, how to mobilize public opinions in order then to go ahead. It has been easier in France because, uh, and in the European Union in general, because for now, I would say seven or eight years, the issue is not an issue anymore. So we've been able to join the Kyoto Protocol in uh, 1997. On us, it's a minus 5.5% of emission in year 12, uh, in year 2012 from 1990, and we'll do a 7% reduction. The whole European Union will do its lot, will, will, will stabilize. We have a commitment to do uh, about um, minus 20 or 30% in year 2020. We have put together, under the French presidency of the European Union, uh, uh, a true, uh, it's called energy package, which we hope will, will work. So we are really engaged in, in, in real action. And this is the reason why, although we have, we are about one third of uh, the world GDP, uh, the European Union, we are only 15% of the emission. So it has been possible because there is that today, it was not the case 15 years ago, but today that strong uh, feeling in the public opinion in England, in Germany, in France, in Italy, that something has to be accepted. So my question is for climate action, for your, 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 your institution, how is it possible to help the new president, but to help also the various governors and to help Congress to be involved in strong commitment and real action? Well, I think the question of uh, mobilizing public opinion and mobilizing the political classes and the decision makers is obviously an extremely crucial aspect. And I hope that uh, it's something that the three speakers who come after the coffee break will actually reflect on. Um, but because um, I, I, I think it is such a crucial, a crucial point. Uh, how do we pass not only to engineering action, how do we pass to political action and influencing public opinion?